Stars enabled. Stars enabled. So, here we are. Alright, good morning, everybody. Morning. 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 So, we have our uh, Zoom and our Facebook Live running at the same time. And we're able to get some worship music in this morning. So, without further ado, the No Frills uh, Church here, folks. Let's get our... Uh, Let's get our heads bowed and let's get a moment of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, God, we come before you humbly, Father. We ask you, God, for the power of your Holy Spirit. Help us to understand your word, the Bible. Speak to our hearts, God. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, God. Surround us with your angels. Protect us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So today's title of the message is, Who is charged? Who is in charge around here? Who is in charge around here? And I'm getting myself, my view, I'm on the Zoom here, so I'm taking my hide self view because I don't want to sit here and look at myself. I'm going to look at everyone else on Zoom, so... There we go. All right. So, who is in charge around here? Who is in charge around here? Now, you might have saw a little bit of a shake here. It looked like we had an earthquake, but we're in an RV, and things can get rocky in the RV, okay? So, if the camera starts rattling, it just means someone got up to use the banyo or whatever. Um, so, nevertheless, who is in charge around here is today's title, but I wanted to just see if the church has remembered the goals from last week and just by a quick show of hands how many of us remembered to follow through with last week's goals of praying for people that we might not like uh, throughout the week praise God All right. so we might have another goal at the end of this sermon we'll see um, so praise God for that praise God we're praying for our enemies last week uh, throughout into this week and, um, you know, we're the ones that get the, the peace from that. So our church members, a lot of the folks have been coming to the Bible study. We've been growing and, and growing in knowledge, growing in wisdom. You guys can hear me okay over there? All right, beautiful. So we've been growing in knowledge. We've been growing in wisdom. And I'm going to actually hit some lights over here. Uh, there you go. All right. Does that look any better, Ethan? Yeah. So we've been growing in knowledge and we've been growing in wisdom and understanding scriptures, right? Even our 15-year-old son, he's been rattling off scriptures regularly. Praise God for that, right? My uh, Many of the, of the folks that have been coming regularly have a better understanding of the Bible and of the Word of God as a result and are able to go even into certain prophecies and are able to articulate these things. Now, granted... There are folks that are just coming around and, and, and are new, and as the Bible says, are, are like babes, right? That are, that are on the milk, that are on the, the more simplistic things of the Bible, but they're not some of us that have gone into the meat, right? As, as the Bible explain, uh, as it explains in the Bible. We come in and we are born again as a baby, right? And the baby's not going to sit here and eat a ribeye steak, amen? No, the baby's going to nurse and come along. Nursing on the Word of God, grow into a toddler, as we were talking about last week, and eventually into a full-grown, mature person. And in, and in the Bible, it talks about it. It talks about the rebirth, the be, being born again. The Bible says, unless you be born again, except a man be born again, he will not enter the kingdom of God. Amen? Everybody knows that. It also talks about, unless you be converted and become as a little child, you will not enter into the kingdom of God. Yes? So we need to go through this process. And it also talks about, be you perfect as, Jesus says, be you perfect as my Father in heaven is perfect. And when we look up the word perfect in the Bible, it's talking about maturity. It's talking about a place of spiritual maturity. That's the goal for us, right? So as we're picking up knowledge and gaining knowledge, we need to also be growing, more importantly, we need to be growing in our relationship with Christ and developing our our love muscles, so to speak, right? We need to like flex our love muscles around here. It's a spiritual principle that we need to master in our walk with Jesus Christ because that's the foundational principle all throughout the Bible. 
Last week we were focused more on loving God, which is was Jesus summarized as the first and greatest commandment. He summarized this as the first and greatest commandment. Where did he summarize it from? He summarized it from the writings of old. This was not a new thing that came on the scene when Jesus showed up. Okay? But so we focused on the loving God first principle, and now this week we're going to move a little bit more into loving thy neighbor. So who is thy neighbor? The Bible says to love your neighbor as yourself. Who is our neighbor? Is it just us, Christians? We just got to love each other? Right? It's just my brother and sister in Christ. I only have to love them. Anybody else, it's <laughs> see you later. Don't have to worry about that. The Bible says no. It says that's easy. It says if you're doing that, who you know, even the tax collectors are doing that, right? Another way of saying tax collectors now would be like even the IRS is doing that. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, so, not that there's not Christians in the IRS. I'm sure there is, but nevertheless, you know, it's a reference to people that aren't in with Jesus Christ, that aren't rolling with God, and they're still loving their people. They're still loving their kids and stuff like this. People that don't know God, they don't know Jesus, they're still showing love to their family and friends. And Jesus says, so what difference is it if you're doing the same thing? No, you need to love your enemies. You need to love your enemies, is what he says. Let's go back for just for a refresher, a reminder to Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, to in verse 45. And then we're going to skip over, over to Matthew 18 after that, just so we can get... An understanding of the seriousness of the nature of the situation, right? We can't we can't take these things lightly, okay? Matthew chapter five, verse forty four through forty five, what's it say? But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, mm -hmm. and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Now I know I highlighted this last week, but can you imagine the people that are that are using you, that they're 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 persecuting you. They're bad-mouthing you. They're doing all that stuff. Jesus has said, listen, you need to love these people. You need to show kindness to these people. And then? That ye may be the children of your Father, which is in heaven. Mm -hmm. For he maketh his son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just. So in order to be a child, a child of your Father in heaven, what must we do? According to the scriptures you just read, Tara. Let me help you out. Verse 44, what's it say we need to do there? Love your enemies. Love your enemies. And then in verse 45, it says, There you will then you will be a child of your father in heaven. Want to repeat that? Verse 45. That ye may be the children of your father which is in heaven. Amen. That the that you may be the children of your father which is in heaven, if you're loving your enemies. So listen, there's, there's conditions to this, right? There's characteristics of a Christian that we need to be showing love. We need to, and that's a battle from within because our human nature doesn't want to love our enemies. I don't, I don't know about anybody else. I'll talk about myself. I don't want to love my enemies. I want to, my pride, my, my fleshly self wants to smash my enemies into non-existence, right? My, my, my flesh wants to make my enemies go bye-bye. I don't want to love my enemies, but in order to be a child of God, I need to learn how to condition myself through the power of the Holy Spirit to show love to those that persecute me. I don't like being persecuted. I don't know about anybody else. It doesn't feel good to me. Someone starts bad-mouthing me and talking all this stuff. My inclination isn't to go over and hug it out. No, I want to cause damage. That's the flesh. But we need to have the Spirit living in us. Let's go over to Matthew chapter 18, verse 3. Uh, and he said, Verily I say unto you, Jesus Christ talking, Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Unless you be converted and become as little children, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. That's not just saying Jesus Christ, family. Sometimes people will try to, and I know I drive this home all the time, but like some places will just try to drive home like you just... Say Jesus Christ and you're all set. You're saved forever. You're all done. And that's not the case. The, Jesus just said, said it himself. Unless you be converted and become as a little child. So who are we listening to? The pastor on Sunday or the Bible? I'm listening to the Bible. I'm listening to the guy who came up with the whole thing. Jesus Christ. 
<laughs> not listen to somebody else who has their spin on it. It's pretty plain and simple, right? So as we grow in knowledge and understanding, right, we must grow in God's love. Otherwise, it's dead. Otherwise, our relationship is dead. Let's go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 2. This is the writings of Paul, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, verse 2. And though I have the gift of prophecy... And though I have the gift of what? Prophecy. And... And understand all mysteries. Understanding all what? Mysteries. Listen, does the Bible ever seem very mysterious to you? Do you ever pick up the Bible and you start reading things and you're like, what is this talking about? Right? How is this connecting to things? And then as you continue to study, you start to connect the mysteries, right? You start to connect some of the things that the Bible was written thousands of years ago and has has prophesied things that were going to happen in real time that you can check from the Bible and compare it to secular history and it actually happened in the way that God said it would happen, right? And you start connecting these mysteries and these prophecies and you're like, wow, right? And you and so Paul's saying, listen, even though I can understand all prophecy and mysteries, right? But look at what he's going to finish saying here. And all knowledge and Though I have all faith, so I could remove mountains. Yeah, he has so much faith, he could remove mountains, right? He understands with all knowledge. And have not charity, I am nothing. And have not what? Charity. Charity. I don't know if anyone knows what charity is, but charity is the highest form of love. If you're not reading a King James, it usually just will have love there. If you have the New King James or any other Bibles, it will usually just put love in this, in this chapter. Okay, And so Paul just said, even though I understand all prophecy, right? I understand all the mysteries in the Bible. I have all the knowledge. I have so much faith that I can move a mountain. But if I don't have love in me, it's nothing. It's nothing. Right? It's the same thing in the book of James where it talks about faith without works is dead. Your faith, if it doesn't have action behind it, is useless. Your ministry, your knowledge of God, your testimony, you're all that, if it doesn't have love in it, God just said it's nothing. It's useless, right? Let's let's take a look at that chapter, actually. We're going to take a look at the chapter of 1 Corinthians. And we're going to take it from the top because this is very important. This is, the, this is a chapter in the Bible that really focuses in on love. In verse 1 it says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I have become as a sounding brass or a tingling cymbal, right? One time I did a message and I came out and, and I brought a bunch of pots and pans right in the beginning when we first started doing it. I just started talking and banging the pots and pans. And I'm like, you guys understood everything I said? And everyone was like looking at me like, what's wrong with this guy, right? But the point is, is you can't, listen, if I'm, I could talk all day long, but there's not love behind it, I might as well just be banging a bunch of stuff together. Just making a bunch of noise is what the Bible's saying. And then the verse that Tower read says, And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries, and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, that I could remove mountains, and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profited me nothing. Charity, which is love, remember, is suffer long and is kind. Charity does not envy. Charity does not vaunt itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave unseemingly or seek her own. It is not easily provoked and it thinks no evil. It rejoices not in iniquity, which is lawlessness, family, but rejoice in the truth. Love bears all things and believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Charity never fails, but where there is prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. That's so deep, right? God will give you some prophecy. God will show you some things in the world, in the word, right? We can look forward as Christians today. We can look forward to things or events that are happening now and understand that they are prophecy. 
things that are uncomfortable that are going on in the world that some of us want to just go and handle. And we got to remember that Jesus told Peter, when Peter told Jesus, oh no, you're not going to the cross, he said, get behind me, Satan. Peter wanted to protect Jesus and his flesh. But Jesus told him, he said, nah, -uh. he said, get behind me, Satan. He said, you're worried about the things of men and not the things of God. These are things that are prophesied to happen that I must go to the cross. Amen? Amen. So we not we so even though we can recognize things today and say, oh, there's here's a prophecy coming true, right? Or we can look back and say, wow, this thing happened as the Bible said it's prophecy. We only know in part. We only know in part. And that's what the Bible just said here. We know part of it. But that but when that, this is verse 10, but but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. And he goes on here in the last few verses. He said, When I was a child, I spoke as a child, and I understood as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Talking about when we finally get face to face with Jesus Christ. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am known. Now abided faith, hope, and charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Amen to that, family. The greatest of these is love. So we can be understanding all the stuff we want to understand. Now again, remember, we're talking about loving our neighbor today, family, and we're setting the foundation. Because like I said, our church is growing. Members are growing in knowledge. We are gathering more information. But all that information means nothing if we're not showing love. And this is one of the, you know, this is one of the challenges for us. So love is the core principle throughout the Bible. We're going to turn over to Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Luke chapter 10, start in verse 25. We'll take a look at a situation here. Yep. That's going to articulate some stuff for us. Uh, and behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master. Uh, tempted who? Just so we know. Tempted Jesus Christ. A certain lawyer stood up. Check it out. He's a lawyer, right? I had a lawyer coming at me the other day. It can be tough to deal with. All right? But you got to love him anyway, so we pray for the guy. Saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, here's the question that the, that the lawyer asked Jesus Christ. He said, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? What is written in the law? Pay attention now, family, because a lot of the times that the people, some people will say, Oh, the law is done away with. The law was, was a bunch of uh, things, the, the, these, these things that we had to do, which was a burden on us, right? It was an unnecessary yoke that was put upon us. It's, it's tied us to this law. But we have to also understand and know that the Bible itself is the law. Jesus references, he says, as you have, as you have heard in your law, and, he's and he goes to the book of Psalms. Right? So the whole Bible is the law, and we need to be able to differentiate which part of the law are we talking about. So he goes and he says to the guy, he says, What is written in the law, and how readest thou? How do you interpret this, he says to him. And now here's the response of the attorney, verse 27. And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as yourself. Amen. Check out what he said here. This is an Old Testament cat. See, sometimes, and this is just a little touch on last week's message for, for those who are paying attention, sometimes folks take the New Testament and they say, oh, no, now it's all about love. But in the Old Testament, it was all about these, these regulations and rules. No, this guy just answered and summarized the exact law in the way that Jesus Christ summarized the law when we read it in Matthew. And he was quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5, just like this attorney's quoting from. And he was quoting from Leviticus 19.18, Love thy neighbor as thyself, as this man is quoting in this piece. Okay? Everybody's with me so far on this? Amen. All right. Keep going, Ethan. 
He said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. So check out what Jesus said to him. If you do this, you shall live. If you do this, you shall live. See, Jesus came and gave more depth into the commandments. He didn't remove the commandments. He gave more life to those. He brought it into a deeper level. He's like, you guys are just keep keeping this straightaway law. He's like, no, there's more to it. It needs to be ingrained into our hearts. Amen? Amen. All right. So he goes on here. In verse 29, the attorney says, But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, Who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? Now remember the question that I asked in the beginning. Are we just to love our brothers and sisters in Christ? No. So he goes on to give him a parable. And then Jesus answered him and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves which stripped him of his raiment, which means his clothes, and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Imagine that. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. By chance a priest rode by. Can you believe it? Imagine, this guy was beat half to death, got all his stuff taken, but lo and behold, here comes a priest. This guy's going to be okay. And the priest came down that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. The priest dipped right by. Hey, that guy's over here where you guys are, over in the garage. The priest came like this and did this. And went on by, man. He went on by. And likewise, a Levite, which the Levites were... Part of the priesthood in the Old Testament. Amen? Amen. A Levite. Surely this guy's going to stop. This is a man of God. And when he was at the place, came and looked on him. That sounds promising. He saw him, right? He looked down. Can you imagine a man beaten, half naked, rolled up on the ground, and you're a man of God, a child of God, a woman of God, whatever it may be, and you look and, and, it, and you looked and saw that person on the ground, right? You're going to stop and try to help him? And pass by on the other side. On the other side, right? So you got to imagine, he was probably on the same side as the road as this dude, and looked and went and crossed the street. Took off. Away, away he went, man. Horrible. Can you imagine that was you beat up on the ground like that? Can you imagine that was your child, your wife, your, your, your loved one, your mother, your father, your grandmother, beat down on the ground, and these so-called Christians, right? I know we're talking about the Jews here, but this is referencing to us too, right? Because we're on, we're, now we're grafted in as Christians, Right, and a so-called Christian looks and sees the beat down, the pain, the sorrow, the hurt, all that, and they just looked and then kept it moving and went the other direction, right? And you wonder why so many people are so opposed to God and his teachings and the things like this, because they hear the falsehood, right? They hear those of us get up and start talking about Jesus, 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 and then when the stuff comes down to it, their character reflects the enemy. Jesus said in Luke 6, 46, he said, Why you call me Lord, 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 and not do the things that I said to do? It doesn't make sense. Jesus said, you need to love your enemy. You need to show love. He said, listen, in our Bible, it says, if you can understand and be all knowledgeable and everything else, he said, but if it has not love, it's dead. It's useless. It's nothing. It means nothing. You're just, you're just banging pots and pans together around people. So check it out. But a certain Samaritan, right? I don't know if anyone knows about the Samaritans, right? But the, the Samaritans, and the Jews hated the Samaritans. Okay? They wouldn't even talk to these people. Okay? So if we kind of think about this like today, right? We have Muslims, Jews, Christians. Um, you have all these different kinds of people. Some people hate each other, right? You go over to Northern Ireland. I mean, there's peace over there now, but for a long time, there's somewhat of peace. 
but for a long time you had the Protestants and the, and the Catholics and they were battling, blowing each other up, Sunday, bloody Sunday, everyone heard the U2 song, you know, killings and all this other stuff, people hated each other, right? So this is the person that was hated and probably hated the Jew. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And he went to him, and he bound up his wounds. He bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, right? He was going through... He, Whatever that animal was, he put this 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 beat up man on this animal, and he brought him to an inn, and he took care of him. Listen up, family. He took care of him. He didn't just stop and ask somebody else to go help the guy. He dressed his wounds up and picked the person up and put them on his animal, right? And then brought him all the way to an inn, like a hotel or a place for him to be cared for, right? Everybody with me here? He brought him to a place to be cared for, and the man stood there and took care of this person, this stranger, this person from another land that hated him. He took care of him. He said the Bible said he had compassion on him, all right? He brought him to the inn and he took care of him. And on the morrow, the next day, when he departed, he took two pence, meaning two, his money, and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him. Whatsoever thou spendest more than what I gave you, Keith, other room, when I come again, I will repay thee. That part's not the Bible. Keith, other rooms not in the Bible. Just don't want anyone to get confused here. Some of you be going through the Bible later on, like Keith in the other room. He said he heard that story on Superbook. Oh, he did hear that story on Superbook. Praise God. Huh. All right, you did. So keep listening, right? <coughs> and when I come again, I will repay thee. Right? He said, "Listen, here's some money for this guy to take care of him, feed him, whatever it may be. I got to take off." He's like, "And when I come back, if if it costs you more money." I'm going to take care of that. I'm going to pay you back when I get back to this place. All right, just look out for this guy, please. And he said, Which now of these, thinkest thou, was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said unto him, Go and do now likewise. Go and do now likewise. Understand the commandment from God, right? Mm -hmm. It's not about your brothers and sisters and stuff like this in Christ. Yes, we're supposed to love each other, but we're supposed to love and have compassion on everybody, family. We're supposed to love even the people that are persecuting you. Mm -hmm. Even the so-called Christians that are telling you, ah, nah, that stuff you're hearing about Sabbath, nonsense. That stuff that you're hearing in your little Bible study, it's all hogwash, right? That stuff that they're trying to show you, oh yeah, it says in the Bible, ah, they're twisting scriptures, you don't understand the word, garbage, right? They're trying to throw all that stuff out on you, we're supposed to love them. We're supposed to have compassion on them. No, we're not supposed to be lined up alongside of them talking about, yeah, you know, we're cool and this and that, we believe the same stuff because that's a false representation of Jesus Christ, amen? But we're supposed to have compassion regardless and love and show kindness. Listen, it's a challenge. So we got to ask ourselves, do we do this now? Because this is our job, family. Do we help the people that are new coming through the door, that are beat up? Are we showing compassion and love on those that are like coming and, 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 and for those in the recovery process that are coming in here, that are tore up from the floor up, that are beat up from the feet up? And are we showing them love when they come walking in the room to a meeting? When they come walking in and their hair is all like this, they're all smashed up, looking a mess, train wreck. Are you going over and saying, hey, how you doing, right? Let me give you a hug. You know, welcome. You know, we need you. Yeah, you, you know, you're doing town, whatever, like, and hooking them up with phone numbers, right? Are we taking newcomers over to the store and helping them get food? Are we, are we, are we like, looking and saying, dude, like, them sneakers are trash. Like, here's another pair of sneakers. Like, I got you. Don't worry about it. And then, and then when someone's like, listen, you know, I, 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 I'm going to pay you back and I'm going to pay you back. And you're like, dude, no, just pay it full. 
take this and remember it and give it to somebody else. Are we doing that? I'd like to say a lot of us are doing that, praise God. I'd like to say that we're the blessed and fortunate folks around here because we also have to, God's also blessed us and given us a program of recovery that's taught us how to live and give back. Amen? Amen. See, a lot of churches don't have that peace. A lot of churches will tell you you don't even need to do meetings and that, and that stuff's a bunch of nonsense too. And pray for, pray for that crew too because, listen, we need, to, we need to learn how to take care of people. We need to be taught how to take care of people. You know, when someone gets sick, right, and, and they're going through some stuff, are we going there and visiting with them? Are we going there and saying, hey, listen, you know, we brought you some food or whatever? Or, you know, are we, how are we looking out? Right? And it doesn't have to be your best friend. It could be someone you're not that close with or that cool with, right? Are we going out of our way to show compassion on other people? Providing clothes, providing housing, giving someone a place to stay, doing these things, right? This is what the guy did. This is what the Good Samaritan did. This is what Jesus said. Go and do likewise. That's your neighbor. He said, "Who? which one of the three dudes that went by is the guy's neighbor? It wasn't the priest. It wasn't the Levite. It was the Samaritan. It was the other guy from another place. It is, and, it, and as, listen, as, as messed up as that is, thank God for that Samaritan guy. See, Matthew 5, 16 says, you are the light of the world. It says, the Bible tells us we do not light a candle in a room and then put, a, put it under a bushel, it talks about, right? Put it under a basket. Imagine that, the power goes out, it's pitch black in here, and here I come with a candle, and everyone's like, oh, wow, he's got a candle, that's awesome, great, we didn't think we had any, right? And I'm like, yeah, I got a candle, and I put it down the table, and we're all looking at each other, we haven't seen each other in hours because it's dark out, and all of a sudden I went over and I said, whoop, and put a basket over it, and we're back in darkness. You'd be like, Keith, what are you doing, dude? Right? Jesus said, listen, you're the light of the world. People need to see your light. Why? So they can glorify your good works and, and, and glorify your God. They can see your good works, the Bible says, and glorify your Father that's in heaven. That's why. So when they see you doing good for somebody else, it's not about you. It's about God. So they can get attracted and come to the true God. So they can see Jesus Christ, for real, working through somebody else, showing love, showing compassion, showing that peace that, that surpasses all understanding happening inside of you, right? And they can say, wow, man, like God is real. They want to know more about that stuff. Let's go over to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18. And he is the head of the body. And this is talking about Jesus Christ, family, right? We have to remember, Jesus Christ is the head of the body. Uh, the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from, from the dead, uh, that in all things he might have uh, preeminence. He is the head of the body of the church, which is us. Jesus Christ is the head. Okay. We're the body. We're the body of Christ. Christ says to you, you need to go and do this. He's the head. The body goes and does it. Amen? Amen. See, the false Christ, the false apostles that we learn about in, in 2 uh, Corinthians, right, where it talks about Satan masquerades as an angel of light, talking about he's Jesus Christ, but he really isn't. Everybody paying attention over there with me over here? Yeah. So listen, he's talk listen, we're not talking about the false Christ. We're talking about the true Christians. See, Satan transforms himself into an angel of light. And I need to share that for the person that been the people that are watching this, right, that have been hurt by so-called Christians. Those are Christians. Those are false prophets. Those are those are Satan's ministers. Because the Bible says, don't marvel at that, because even his ministers are transformed into the ministers of righteousness. The false apostles of Christ, right? That do damage to God's people. So then people say, oh, I don't believe in that nonsense Christianity stuff. Well, because they're not seeing the true Christian take place, family. They're not seeing the true Christian take place. The true Christian is listening to the head. Listen, where does who who's in charge of the body, family? Who's in charge? The Jesus, and he's the head, right? So check it out. The head 
tells the body what to do, yes? Think about it in your own self right now. All right? Think about it in your own self. Your head tells you, everybody go like this. Lift your right hand up. Put it down. Lift it up. Put it down. Up, down, up, down, up, down. down, down, down. You see that? Your brain did all that. Your head did all that. The hand did not do that on itself. The head don't listen to the hand. Imagine it was the other way around. Imagine the hand took over. You're walking down the street. You're minding your business. And all of a sudden, your hand does this. And knocks you out. The hand took over. That's how it's supposed to work? No. I don't think so. The head controls the body. The head tells the body what to do. Some will say, oh, well, you know, it's, it's about the heart, though. The heart's in the body. Right? The heart's in the body. Let's check out what the Bible says. Let's go over to Proverbs 23, verse 7. For as he thinketh in his heart... As he think where? In his heart. In his heart. Hear the connection? When the Bible's talking about the heart, it's talking about your core belief. And where's your core belief? Still happening up here. Your core belief system still up here. Everyone heard of CBT and all that stuff? Talking about your core belief system and, and if, you know, your irrational belief system and, and that triggers an irrational thought and then you can say, oh, all or nothing. Oh, that's an irrational thought. And then you challenge your thought and then through challenging your thought and changing your thought, you'll change that irrational belief. Anyone heard of all this clinical stuff? <laughs> Anyways, right? The Bible, when it's talking about your heart, is talking about your belief. It's up here. It's what you believe is all up here. That heart is up here. All right, so keep going there. So is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee. That's all. That's it right there. Let's go over just to see the same principle that's in Proverbs, right? As he think in his heart, right? Let's go over to Luke chapter 5, verse 22. Uh, but when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answering said unto them, He what, perceived their thoughts. What reason ye in your hearts? What reason you in your hearts, Jesus said. He perceived their thoughts, he said. He said, why are you reasoning this in your hearts? So the heart is part of the mind. Our mind needs to be of Jesus Christ, family. Okay? Our mind and our thoughts need to be centered on Jesus Christ when centered on love. We have the direction. We have the direction. We must have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Amen. Amen. We have the mind of Christ, family. We need to put on the whole armor of God every day when we get up. We got to remember, we know that this is a day at a time process, right? We know because a lot of us, our lives are on the line if we forget that stuff. So when we pick up Luke 9 23, and Jesus is talking about if you want to follow after me, deny yourself and pick up your cross daily, we're like, yep, I understand what that's talking about. When Paul says, listen, even though my outward man, I'm getting older and stuff, but day by day, my, in my inner man is growing more spiritually, right? We understand that stuff because we're in that process. We understand that if we don't continue to, to line ourselves up with Christ and feed our spirits, listen, we don't just stop, we go backwards. See, we get that stuff, family. We understand that stuff. We need to rely on Him. We need to know Him. Right? We need to study Him. 2 Timothy 2.15 2 Timothy 2.15 talks about study. Show thyself approved. A workman under God that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We need to understand who God is. We need to study the word. And we need to be able to rightly divide the Bible. The word of truth. We need to be able to rightly divide this thing. Romans chapter 10, verse 14 through 15. Let's, let's go over there real quick. Uh, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? It's talking about Jesus Christ. Okay? It's just talking about Jesus Christ. Now, if you back up a few verses, we're not going <coughs> to... In Romans 10, 10 or Romans 10, 12, talks about if you say Jesus Christ and you believe in your heart that he is the Lord, you're saved. Okay? You're saved. But now we need to go a step further and see what this is talking about. What does it mean to believe in Jesus Christ? It's not just some abstract thing where you can just say, Oh, I believe in this thing and not understand it. 
there has to be a, some understanding in order to believe in it, right? Otherwise, you might as well just go believe in a unicorn or something. I mean, it's like, it doesn't even make sense. Oh, you know, Joey Bag of Donuts down the street told me that the Cyclops is real. Now I believe in Cyclops. Or mermaid. Or mermaid. <laughs> right? Doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Doesn't matter what Joe Bag of Donuts told you down the street. This is what the Bible says. Let's go to let's go to verse 14 and 15, please. Uh, and how shall they believe in him in whom they have not heard? How are they going to believe on him in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? How are they going to hear without a preacher? And how th shall they preach except they be sent? Yes. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Amen. Amen. In verse 17, what's it say down there? So faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You want to increase your relationship with Jesus Christ? You want to increase your faith? Faith's going to come by hearing, and hearing the word of God. This is it right here. This is how we hear it. I'm doing the preaching, tying in the scriptures, and we got to get into the word and study more of it. And there we start to understand more of God and his character family. So we must humbly study God and understand him and be in fellowship with each other. Right? And empower each other and strengthen each other. That's another reason we're so blessed to have, like I've said before, those in recovery. Not, every, not everyone watching these sermons is in recovery, but for those that are in recovery, that are working programs... How blessed are we that God showed us these things? Because these things help us to understand God on a deeper level. These things point us towards God. These characteristics that we must have. So we become born again. We start to accept Jesus Christ into our lives, right? We become born again. That means I'm, I'm, I'm changing my ways from what I was this, this person. I'm being born again into a new person, right? But I have to remember that it's a birth. And that it takes time to grow into even into a child. Right? And as we become converted, we start changing some stuff out of our lives. We start nixing some stuff out. You know, if we're a vengeful, spiteful, I'm going to get you kind of guy or gal, right? We start to rework some of that stuff. We start to realize that, man, God doesn't like that kind of stuff. So I need to figure out how to get out of this kind of out of this kind of process of thinking, right? So what do I do? Second Corinthians thirteen five says I examine myself. So I gotta take a look within and see what is going on with me, man. Why do I respond to the things I respond to in the way that I do? What's that all connected to? How do I go about getting rid of that stuff, right? I go to God, I start asking God, please God take this from me. And stop practicing some different principles. Stop practicing some stuff, even if I don't think it's going to work. So God said, i got to be nice to this person. Normally I would tell this person to go fly a kite. Mm. But now I'm on a new trajectory, a new life. So I'm going to do a practice day today. And I'm going to go to the person that I would normally tell this person where to go and how to get there. But now this time I'm going to go and I'm going to show kindness. Remember the first time we tried to do stuff like this, family? And you were like, you're like yeah, no. and you try to be nice, and you were all awkward and stuff, because you weren't used to it. But it was a practice. But you did the nice thing, and even if you didn't get a nice response, you get a little bit of spiritual uplifting. It's like that little spirit starts to go, oh. It's like, what was that? And you're like, whoa, what was that? It's a good feeling inside, right? So you're like, oh, I want to try that again. Mm -hmm. And then you try it again, and your spirit goes, ooh, right? And every time you practice these principles, your spirit grows inside of you. The Holy Spirit gets more and more enlarged inside of you because the temple of the living God is starting to be cleaned out. And the spirit is starting to spread around a little bit and get a little bit more comfortable inside the temple, Right? And it's a little bit more welcoming to the Spirit. And, and you feel good inside. And you're able to give back, right? And then you start seeing, listen, then you start realizing, man, the lights are coming back on, man. I'm, I'm having a whole different perspective on stuff. And then you start seeing the lights start coming on in somebody else's eyes. And you start watching them go through their process. Someone who came in destroyed from the world. 
and you start seeing them come back to life, family. This is what we do around here. So I have set a goal. We lost a couple participants. I'm looking at an empty couch over there. But nevertheless, I have a goal uh, for the next seven days. The next seven days for all of us is to do something nice for somebody each day. It can be a friend. It can be... It, it could be a family member if it needs to be, but I prefer it to be someone that you're not too fond of or that you don't know for the next seven days. But if it, Or it could be a family member that aggravates you. Me. <laughs> <laughs> All right? We're in an RV down here. Like I said in the beginning, it's real quick to get aggravated in the, in the smaller quarters, right? You got five of us and a cat. We can, we can get on each other's nerves sometimes. So, so that's the goal for the week, right? That's the plan for the week is to do something nice for somebody. And, it, and, it, and if it's somebody who's aggravated you, that's the bonus round, right? If you can do nice stuff for people that you don't really like each day of the week, just one thing. That's all. Just one thing. And then God willing, we'll, we'll check back in here uh, next week and see how all that is going. We have a... Uh, uh, Travis is going to be coming to Sharon, uh, preaching for us next week. Um, so, so we're looking forward to that, right? We're going to have that streamed, and and um, and, and we'll be on the uh, on the Facebook Live here as well. So, why don't we uh, bow our heads in prayer? Heavenly Father, God, God, we we thank you, God, for your word, the Bible. God, thank you for your instruction, um, showing us how to live showing us how to just to be obedient to you, God, knowing that you see the beginning uh, to the end <coughs> and that you are having mercy on all of us here, God, and, and have promised us um, life forever with you in heaven, God. And, and we just ask you to strengthen us in this day, this Sabbath day, God, to just be kind and be loving, not only to our neighbors but to ourselves, to know that even if our heart condemns us, God, that you are above our hearts and know all things, Father. Help us to just be filled with love. We thank you for this, this, this uh, not this study, but this preaching here, this, this, this time that we've been able to spend, God. And we, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let me stop the El Livo.